Hey everyone! Today we're diving into the powerful async package for Golang. If you've ever wanted to offload time-consuming tasks in your applications, things like sending emails, processing images, or handling complex workflows, this package has you covered. So let's get started. Async is a task queue library for Golang, similar to Sidekick in Ruby. It lets you run tasks in the background, improving the responsiveness and scalability of your apps. Let's see how this works. Client puts tasks on a queue. We can also call it the producer. A client puts tasks on different queues. Then comes the server or the consumer that pulls tasks from queues and process them. It also comes with cool features like retry, scheduling concurrency, and even a built-in monitoring dashboard. First things first, let's install the package. Done. You'll also need Redis, since Async relies on it for managing queues. Now let's take a real-world example, sending welcome emails. It's a classic task that you don't want to block your web requests with. This project is structured in three directories. The producer, it puts tasks in queues. The consumer, it runs the workers that consume tasks from queues. The tasks. This directory contains the tasks code. It is common to both the producer and the consumer. We will begin by creating a bunch of constants that specify the type of tasks. Let's create a new file here, consts.go. Here, we define our task types as constants. The first constant is type email, which we set to the string email colon delivery. This represents a task related to email delivery. Similarly, we define two other tasks for report generation and image processing. Now, we will create a new file for the email task, email.go. Here we define a struct called email payload. This struct will represent the data needed for our email task, including the recipient's email address, the subject, and the body of the email. Now, let's create a helper function to generate a new email task. This function will take the email address, subject, and body as inputs, and it will return an async task and an error in case something goes wrong. First, we construct our email payload. We use the JSON Marshall function to serialize the email payload struct into a JSON byte slice. If marshalling fails, we return an error. Once we have our JSON payload, we use async.newTask to create the task. Here, type email is the task type, which we defined earlier in our constants file. The second argument is the payload. Finally, we return the task. And that's it. This function encapsulates the logic for creating an email task, making it reusable throughout our code base. Now we have the way to create the task. Let's use this code to create a task and post it on the queue. The producer code will serve as the entry point of our application, where we'll enqueue tasks to our Redis-backed queue. First, we define a constant Redis, which specifies the Redis server address. This is where all our tasks will be stored. We have it running on localhost. Inside our main function, we initialize a new async client with the Redis address. This client is responsible for communicating with the Redis server. We call the function new client. We need to pass connection options. So, we call Redis connection option with Redis address. 
We also use defer to ensure that the client is properly closed when the function exits. Now, we create our first task using the new email task helper function from the tasks package. We pass the email ID, subject and the body. This function returns the task and an error. If there's an error in task creation, we log and exit. Once the task is created, we use client.onQueue to add it to the queue. If enqueuing is successful, we log the task ID and the queue it was added to. By default, this will go into the default queue. Let's learn how to set up a worker server to process the tasks. As before, we define the Redis address where our queue lives. The worker server will connect to this Redis instance to fetch and process tasks. Next, we initialize the async server. The new server function takes two arguments, the Redis configuration and the server configuration. In the async.config struct, we set a concurrency of 10, meaning the server can process up to 10 tasks simultaneously. We also define queue priorities using a map. For example, the critical queue is allocated 6 workers, the default queue gets 3, and the low queue gets 1. This ensures high priority tasks in the critical queue are processed faster. Here we create a serve mux. This is like a router but for tasks. It maps task types to their corresponding handler functions. Here we route type email to the email task handler function. Whenever an email task comes in, this handler processes it. Finally, we start the server. This command tells the server to begin listening for tasks and process them using the task handlers. If anything goes wrong, we log the error and exit. We have not implemented this handler. Let's implement it. This is the signature of email task handler function. It takes a context and an async task as arguments and returns an error. First, we declare a variable p of type email payload. Then we use JSON unmarshal to deserialize the task's payload back into the email payload struct. If unmarshalling fails, we log the error and use skip retry to indicate that this error shouldn't trigger retries. Once the payload is successfully unmarshaled, we log a message indicating that the email is being sent. In a real-world application, this is where you'd integrate with an email sending service. And finally, we return nil, signaling that the task was processed successfully. Now let's try this out. First we run the server. It waits for the tasks to come on the queue. When we run the producer, it puts this task on the queue. The queue is the default one. Here, the job is executed on the server. Let's make things more interesting by adding another kind of task. This task is responsible for report generation. This code is similar to that of the email tasks. It requires the user ID in the payload. This function helps us create the task. Let's create a task in the producer code.
This one generates a report and it's created using the new report task helper from the tasks package. When enqueuing this task, we specify additional options like max retry to allow up to 10 retries in case of failure and timeout to set a maximum processing time. In the server, we add the handler in the mux. Let's run this now. We restart the server so that the new code takes effect. Now, we run the producer. This time, two tasks are put on the queue. This is the second task. On the server, the first task is processed. This is the second task. Next, we're implementing the image processing, a custom task and the worker that processes it. First, we define the image processor struct. This struct will act as our custom handler for image processing tasks. It implements the async handler interface, which requires us to define a process task method. Now, let's define the payload for our task. The image processing payload struct will hold the data our task needs, in this case, the URL of the image to be processed. Here, we create a simple constructor new image processor that initializes and returns an instance of our image processor struct. This is the heart of our image processor, the process task method. It gets called whenever the worker picks up an image processing task. It accepts the context and the task and returns an error. First, we extract the task payload. The task object contains the payload as raw JSON. Using JSON.unmarshal, we convert it into an instance of image processing payload. Next, we log the image URL to indicate the processing has started. In a real-world app, this is where you'd resize or process the image. If everything goes well, we return nil, which tells async that the task was processed successfully. Finally, let's create a helper function, new image processing task, to enqueue tasks. Now, in the producer, let's add the code to enqueue the image processing task. In the server code, we can mux.handle to run the image processing job. It lets us pass in a custom handler object returned by new image processor. This function returns the new image processor. Now, when we run this code, the producer enqueues three tasks. Here is the image processing one. These are the logs from the first two task runs. Here is the third task. Ersync provides a web interface to monitor the queues and tasks. Here is the link to the interface. You can run the web UI using the binary or the Docker image. I'm using the binary. It is running on the default port 8080. This is how the UI looks. Here, it displays different queues. The Servers tab shows the servers that are currently running. Let's stop the server and enqueue a few tasks. Now, there are three tasks that are enqueued in the default queue. Let's take a look. In pending, there are three tasks. Async also provides a way to schedule a task. Let's add the code for that.
Here we have created a new task. While in queuing, we tell it to process in 10 minutes. And we have specified the queue here as critical. Now we enqueue these tasks. In the critical queue, there is one entry in the Schedule tab. Here it shows after how much time this will come into the queue. And that wraps up our dive into the async package. I hope this tutorial has been helpful and has sparked ideas for how you can use async in your projects. Don't forget to explore the official documentation for more advanced features and configurations. If you enjoyed this session, hit the like button and subscribe for more content on Go and other exciting tech topics. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next episode.